to the main event, and we want to talk about blockchain. Um, so uh, I want to introduce our moderator and have our panelists come up here in a moment. Um, our moderator is Josh McIntyre, come up on stage. Uh, he's a software engineer at Microsoft, and he's a cryptocurrency tutor at uh, Chaintoots. That's the, way, the yes. right, correct pronunciation, thank you. Uh, and then panelists, please come to the stage. We have uh, Eugene Leventhal, who's a project manager for partnerships at CMU. Uh, Jeanette Solomon, the CEO and founder of Booksmart, and Kyle Suska, PhD student, blockchain applications uh, at Carnegie Mellon University. <laughs> Let everyone get settled in, microphones on, all that fun stuff. <laughs> All right, yeah, so uh, I think tonight we're gonna have a really fun discussion. Uh, one of the things you'll find about cryptocurrency and blockchain people in general is we tend to be really energetic and passionate and excited about what we're building. So we have a bunch of different questions, some are a little more technical, some not, and we're just gonna keep uh, an exciting and fun discussion going. So I'm gonna start off by asking a question of all three of our panelists. For some context, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, or other ones you might have heard of, track transactions between users on what is called a blockchain or a blockchain database. So panelists, in your own <coughs> words, describe what a blockchain is and why you believe this technology is so important. I guess, you wanna go first? Sure, I'll start. <laughs> Ladies first, thank you. Thank you everyone for having me here today. I'm super excited. I'm usually very energetic, but I've been sick. Um, blockchain, in a nutshell, is a secure database. And it's distributed, it's a ledger, uh, but in a nutshell, it's a database. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to add a little bit to that. What's really interesting about blockchain in particular is that it's a database that supports multiple untrusted writers. So if you're ever familiar with a database, you'll know that there's like a database administrator typically, somebody who has complete authority. In this case, what we're doing is we're designing a very special kind of object where many, many individuals who are all mutually in, uh, untrusted can get together and write a database. And this is held together through an incentive structure that fundamentally bases itself on economics. And there's very little other structures out there that support these kinds of behaviors. And that's really what gives it value. It's kind of the, the key breakthrough of blockchains that differentiates itself from other kinds of data structures. Yeah, and I find it very exciting, especially in the context of public chains, that you can kind of build this shared store of truth, build this shared database uh, in, in an environment where sort of anyone can come in and start interacting with it. It doesn't just need to be like a traditional database, which is limited to sort of uh, approved users and whatnot, and it becomes much more of a, of a public thing. So that, that's awesome. Uh, so for these next couple questions that will be coming up, any of you feel free to take them as you see fit. We'll, I'm sure we'll share, and there's uh, lots of different perspectives to go around. So I am going to build off of something that both of you said that I think is a very interesting question when it comes to blockchain outside of the context of cryptocurrencies. Part of the success of the blockchain in, in the system, part of what keeps blockchain secure, is a system of economic incentives. So um, individuals on the network called miners secure the blockchain, uh, they use their computing and electricity to solve very hard math problems in, in these proof of work systems, and they're rewarded for that computing effort uh, with new coins that are minted, new cryptocurrency coins that are minted, and transaction fees. But if we're talking about blockchain outside of that model of cryptocurrencies, what ideas do you have for incentivizing blockchain security without cryptocurrency tokens being a part of that? I feel like part of that question is also just getting to the difference between public and private blockchains, which I think, like, let's get to that sooner than later. Um, and depending on who you talk to, what their views are, etc., I feel like the terminology and views here can really vary. For me personally, when I'm talking about blockchains, I really mean public chains. 
when it's discussion of more private, something more hyperledger-esque, something uh, that is very intentionally built for corporate functionality, though it tries to learn from the essence of, a pu of public blockchains, I, I personally see that more as advances in distributed databases. Uh, and I think 10 years from now, that's where it'll land. I think we're in this kind of weird intermediary period where, I mean, the term just gets thrown around for just about anything that someone deemed as relevant to blockchain. And, you know, like we've seen just such absurd ideas come out about it. So, yeah, I would just like to draw that distinction and focus that, you know, one of the challenges of getting away from Bitcoin and proof of work is that it took a while, you know, decades of people building on each other's work to get to that point. Uh, I don't necessarily think it's just like, oh, you know, corporate's throwing a billion dollars, so we'll have it tomorrow. So yeah, I, I think that we don't know how long it's gonna take to figure out those alternate incentive models, e if they're even possible in the first place. Right, so I can sort of give you a, <clears throat> a picture of how we think about these two paradigms currently today. Um, generally speaking, you have to ask yourself a question when you set up a network or when you're looking to deploy something using a blockchain, who is it that gets to take part in your consensus model? If you're, for example, a private company and you're setting up a consortium, you have a very good idea ahead of time of who your participants are going to be. So coming to a consensus between sort of a white list of participants really breaks down to voting or some kind of traditional consensus mechanism. When we're talking about a public network, we don't constrain the list of users who can participate. So there's always the unknown that there's some new actors that are going to freely join and leave the network at any point in time. So when we're dealing with consensus models in that open setting, we incentivize things economically. And what we're saying is, we know that the network has come to consensus because sufficient resources have been expended that support a particular consensus. And so the difference between a vote of whitelisted users and a consensus that falls back or has a backstop of economic spending is really the differentiating factor here. So the first thing that you would want to look at when you're, for example, trying to deploy a blockchain solution or identify what the right kind of fit for your problem is, is whether or not you have a good idea or a good understanding of the users that will participate ahead of them. I, I totally agree. I do see the future uh, will not be incentivized by a currency. I think it was a great start. It took forever to get there. And there is no time frame of how long it will take, but the future of blockchain says that it will not be incentivized by crypto. Well, I think we're off to an interesting start, especially talking about these distinctions between blockchains as used in, in a very public global setting with cryptocurrencies versus business applications. So this leads well into my next question uh, that is somewhat related. One of the most important properties of blockchains is their immutability. Once data is added to a blockchain, the transaction cannot re be reversed, the data cannot be removed, and the data cannot be changed. So this is generally a property that's true for all major public blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum because of their proof-of-work consensus model. But how do you think that private chains or business projects uh, can help protect the immutability of their blockchains? I think it will still come down to proof. Pro proof of stake, uh, proof of the asset. At the end of the day, you're looking at math. And if you go back to middle school math, you always need a proof. And the proof will be how you know that this is immutable or it has not been changed. So you'll, have to, you'll still have proof of stake to show that it's immutable. And if someone tries to change it, which in the future will not be possible as part of the blockchain, you'll be able to see that. So if I may follow up, then you uh, see us getting away from the proof of work model that Bitcoin and Ethereum and Bitcoin Cash and all those use uh, more to a proof of stake type of algorithm. I think as a business model, it will move away from proof of work as a business model. So if I could chime in, <clears throat> if we're talking again about open public cryptocurrencies, these are things that anybody can join and they're supposed to be robust with respect to adversaries that have nearly arbitrary resources. We're talking nation states, we're talking really big players with really bad intentions. For those kinds of cryptocurrencies, we're always going to be stuck up against an economic wall. This is fundamental. There's absolutely no way to get around this. So for example, when we look at Bitcoin today, one of the things that people look at as a metric for whether or not it's secure 
is the amount of money it would take in order to fork it. It is absolutely possible. You can fork a cryptocurrency, but you're bounded by the amount of money that that attack would cost. So if you say, look, it's gonna cost $200 million to have a 50% chance of forking it for one hour, we now know the constraints on an adversary that we're protecting against. If we have a cryptocurrency that has a very low market cap, and this is one of those interesting things where the market capitalization of the currency is inherent to the security, if we have a very low market cap cryptocurrency, that number goes down. It may take $100 to fork it for one hour. And so your sort of threshold for security uh, depends in a fundamental way on how much you're spending. Now, if you're talking about a private company or a consortium that's set up, and there's some implicit trust among the actors, there's a whitelist of people who participate, then this sort of degenerates down to a vote. And your backstop process is the conventional legal system. You have a chain that's now auditing and is public, and well, maybe public, and that people can audit. But your backstop process for malicious actors is now you have a contractual obligation to not misbehave. And so, so conventional legal practices apply here. And I remember prior to coming to grad school and then getting into my current role, I, I was working in consulting in New York, mainly focused on financial services. And I remember when I first got the Bitcoin bug, which then uh, misled me to the, oh no, I'm into blockchain, not Bitcoin, and then back to the, no, wait, Bitcoin's where it's at. Uh, but it, in the initial part of the journey, when talking to people from any financial services organization, they're like, oh, you want us to do something immutable? A, that's insane because we always need to be able to be in control of our business functions. B, what about all these new GDPR rules which are coming up in Europe and you know, this is 2014, 15. So then they were already starting to look forward and see, well, the full concept of immutability might actually be scary for us in certain contexts. So we want to work with you know, certain organizations and consortia to develop something. Well, yeah, I mean, it's immutable, but really if we need someone at this permission level might be able to tweak something here and there, which again, for me is why, oh, okay, if that's what you're calling it, that's a distributed database. You know, underlying there's still a consensus mechanism of like how we agree to all of this, but you're not relying on this public open system, which for me is very synonymous with the term blockchain. And I think just in general, the industry is at a point where you ask 10 people what a blockchain is and what they're talking about, and you'll get, you know, nine and a half or 12 different answers somehow. Um, but that, that's just still the world where we're at. So I, I think whenever, especially starting a conversation with someone who it's your first time talking to them about this, it's like, let's spend five minutes level setting on terms just to make sure we don't go off in a crazy town in roughly three seconds because we think we're talking about different things or the same things. That, yeah. So yeah, I think that just getting on the same page of what we mean is important. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting to think that, you know, it, it really depends on what your threat model is, who is trying to change data that you don't want changed. It, it, you could envision a, you know, a healthcare system, for example, where you're trying to avoid doctors or nurses changing data that could be you know, part of a medical malpractice suit. But at the end of the day, the system administrator and the company at large can still change the whole chain. It, it really brings up the question of when, when and when not to use a blockchain. So I will lead that into um, a question about when not to use a blockchain. Um, you know, all of us in here are excited about the potential for this space. I'm, you know, a blockchain and cryptocurrency nut, and I love it. But uh, the reality is, is a lot of people will try to sell you on blockchain as a technology uh, in places where it's really not the proper solution. And so, I would like to get a thought from everyone on the panel as to when you steer businesses, clients, or projects away from implementing blockchain. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take it from an accounting standpoint. The first step is it has to make economic sense. Uh, you have to, it has to solve a problem that your company actually has, and you have to actually map out that issue with the mapped out solution. Someone cannot just come and say, oh, solve it with blockchain. You, it's a business and financial decision, and it has to make sense for your business. So I've done a fair bit of consulting on this, and um, generally when you start a conversation with a company and they have an idea and they think, well, you know, maybe blockchain helps us here, the first question I generally ask them is, who's going to use it? Um, and by that I mean, who needs to participate in an active way? So for example, suppose you're a big logistics company, you operate dozens of hubs, and these hubs talk to, to, to each other, and they need to synchronize information about what packages they have, where they're going, you know, what machines are currently in operation. 
And you ask them, do you trust your employees? Do you trust the people who are operating these terminals? Because if you do, if you trust these users, then there's no issue. There's no need to use a blockchain. Really, you're looking for situations where there is mutual distrust between the members that need to coordinate on a consensus. So now if we have, for example, a consortium where you have multiple companies involved, and I trust my own employees, but I don't necessarily trust the employees of another company, we're sort of crossing jurisdictions here, then things get very interesting. If we do business internationally, and for example, um, you know, I trust my peers here in the United States, but I have less trust in my peers abroad, then we start to get into areas where a consensus among untrusted writers begins to make sense. So once we see something that implicitly has that structure, that's where we really start to find the value add of cryptocurrency or blockchain in particular. I also really enjoyed having that kind of conversation and taking it from the other angle of, well, let me quickly just, let's put on the hat of you don't need blockchain and let's convince ourselves that we do. Uh, and I think that that is always a healthier way because especially you know from the corporate side in like 2015, 16, when I feel like corporates were really just getting the blockchain bug overall, that was a time when, oh, my CEO said we need everything on blockchain, so you know we need a blockchain tomorrow, and like please get me there. And it's just that this is starting off from all the wrong places where you know I'm happy to take your money, but I don't know how much value you're going to get at the end of the day. So I think to add to, to what both of what both of them have said so far. Um, it is healthy to add a dose of skepticism and to really focus on the users and the financial benefit and the usability. Because even if it is in an area, say supply chain, which hypothetically there are a lot of untrusted people, financially it might make a ton of sense because you're spending money kind of confirming things that could be automated. But there's this one great example uh, with Tony Chocoloni, which great example just from the name. Uh, but it, it was this distributor, uh, you know, fair trade chocolate somewhere out of Europe. I think he was a reporter before he started the company. Uh, he worked with some, uh, you know, traditional database company to develop a bean tracker for all of their uh, chocolate and cocoa beans. Um, and then they got convinced by some blockchain company to like, let's throw it all on a chain. And after a year, they're like, yeah, we're stopping that because random transactions got missed that no one can explain. Our farmers have <coughs> no clue what you're talking about most of the time, and your UI UX sucks. So even if ideologically it makes sense in certain areas, that doesn't mean the tech, the packaging of it is mature enough to fill that role right off the bat. So, and I think that's okay, right? If you're talking to someone and their idea is, I want to spend X amount of dollars over the next 10 years, that's very different than I need help tomorrow. Right. And then I think you need to walk them off the ledge and say, no, you don't, let's calm down and let's think about this. If you do have the ability to look at this on a five to 10 year timeline and you look at this as R&D, not as how do I immediately do a new tech implementation and swap out something in my current stack. So I think it, it, it's important to get the time horizon uh, kind of set on, on what you're talking about. Yeah. So I wanna circle back a little bit to talking about the, the, uh, the concept and the topic of consensus and why it's so important in these systems. So obviously we touched on a little bit, you know, proof of work is really the, the gold standard in the major cryptocurrencies. Uh, we have proof of stake coming out uh, as an alternative to that. It tends to be more energy efficient. And I honestly don't know as much as I would like to about what some internal business and private chains are using for consensus. So I was wondering if anybody that knows about that might talk about uh, some of the other algorithms that are out there that maybe aren't popular that are used to uh, get agreement for our shared database. Uh, right, so, so if you're talking about something that people use on a private chain, again, that key differentiating factor is you know the network participants ahead of time. So you can sort of query your list and say, here are the 30 people that are qualified to speak about the consensus of this protocol. Let's just ask them how they feel. And so you sort of pull together what looks like a vote. And you can do this in a number of different ways. You can have sort of central nodes that um, get this data and they bring it together and they actually just you know, tally a vote. Um, you can have networks that currently are implemented as public cryptocurrencies but at their core, there's something that looks like a private chain. So to give you an example, there's a cryptocurrency called EOS. And EOS is a public cryptocurrency, but at its core, at its very center, there's a chain that uses a bunch of time slots. So there's 21 users, and each user gets a time slot in order. And they propose a new block, a new block, a new block. And so when it's your turn, you get to say what happens next, and so on and so forth. And so in this way, they're able to come to a consensus about the ordering of transactions in the history. Um, 
but they're doing it because they know that there's exactly 21 of them, they know who they are ahead of time, everything is sort of pre-identified. So when you allow yourself to relax the condition of do we know who's involved, a lot of these consensus mechanisms happen, they're very energy efficient, and they come to a consensus almost instantaneously. I mean, we're talking 500 milliseconds, or really about two or three round trips uh, of communication traffic. So very, very different properties from what you get when you're working under the constraint of, we don't know who's involved. I think also, I mean, I, I am not a, a CS person by background, and I, I am not a computer engineer, so I, I, this is always an area where I try to defer to people who are actually on the cutting edge of doing this work. But from my perspective, if we're just looking at, say, proof of work, proof of stake, I still personally have much more comfort in work over stake. Uh, I also have some, uh, and, and I see a lot of the benefits that are coming up in a lot of the platforms that are pushing for it, Wearing my policy hat, considering I just finished a policy master's, I have a ton of social and ethical concerns about proof of stake that none of the platforms that are pushing it have alleviated in any significant way, in my opinion. I'm happy to get into that if that's of interest. But I mean, I know like if, if asking for very specific protocols, uh, hot stuff, which I believe is the one underlying Libra, uh, and they have been getting more and more academics just looking at the protocol, uh, not just in the context of Libra itself, which is uh, a behemoth of its own. But uh, there's definitely a lot of interesting work being done. Uh, I'm still personally of the opinion that proof of work is something that took decades to build and we now have 10-ish years of proof of it working in some kind of way. It's still massively inefficient from an electricity standpoint, but look into the electricity input of cloud computing and of every data center that's used. And obviously the social value of these things is very different for now, but what happens if that calculus changes over time? How do we end up viewing it? You know, no one's gonna argue that AWS is bad from an energy perspective because we all fundamentally need them to function for everything. You know, it's very easy to just uh, talk smack about Bitcoin because it's like, oh, well, you know, drug dealers or questionable people use that or tech nerds use that. So why do we need this thing? That, that's not really an apples to apples comparison in my mind too. So I am interested actually, and I think it uh, would be important and interesting for our audience. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the concerns you have surrounding uh, proof of stake algorithms. So I, I guess for me, anything, uh, if there's one thing that we've learned in the last 50 years from economic and financial history, it's that uh, ingenuity and creativity of how to move numbers around to benefit very specific individuals is tremendous and almost boundless. So I do, I believe that there are potential game theoretical balances where proof of stake can really work in certain ways. But we also fundamentally don't know what happens if tomorrow, you know, let's say tomorrow we switch to proof of stake on Ethereum, and then on Friday, Russia says, you know what? We don't like you, Vitalik, you're going down. So like, I, I, I don't, I think it's, it, it, we don't know what that's like to deal with yet. That's not to say we shouldn't do it. I just think we should be much more cautious because what, I heard this one discussion yesterday, just one quick example uh, of financial derivatives, right? And um, he, this one person was specifically saying, well, a concern around financial derivatives as relating to some uh, newer currencies might be the fact that, well, if you build up enough derivatives, then you can stage a 51% attack just with what you own off chain. So no one on chain even realizes that you're a majority owner, but in the back, so there's just so many other things that can be happening, especially as more venture capital comes in, especially as other kind of money flows in with very quick expectations of return. I think it's hard to match that. Let's keep a long-term view on making sure the system is built soundly, and let's make sure we're paying back the people who are keeping the lights on every day. Right, and I'd like to touch on a little bit um, proof of work and proof of stake at like a mile high view, uh, because this is actually a pretty important concept to understand. Um, we wish in cryptocurrencies that we could just go out to the network every time that we had a consensus issue and ask people, how do you feel? Vote on this. Um, but the problem is that when we bring computers and technology into it, people have the ability to create millions and millions of counts and fake votes. So we can't tie consensus to voting. So we need some other way to tie consensus to something that people can't fake. So people can't fake spending money. Doesn't matter how many accounts you create, doesn't matter what kind of fancy stuff you do, if you have to generate a proof for the network that you've spent a certain amount of money, then that's that. And so what we're doing right now with proof of work is computers are essentially doing useless math. And this useless math in expectations statistically 
proves that you have spent some amount of money and that gives weight to your vote. If I have spent $100,000 to tell you that I believe that this is the correct fork or these are the correct transactions, then that vote has weight. So when we look at that, it's kind of a waste, right? We're, we're basically burning money in the form of electricity to uh, give our votes weight. Now, proof of stake diverges from that. They say, well, look, there's other ways to prove that we're not faking accounts here. I can prove that I own currency on the network. And maybe this even makes sense because I'm incentivized to help the network because I have some stake here. I've got money on the table. Now, the problem with this is that we can have users who have very little at stake. They don't own a lot of this currency. They're, in some sense, very unreliable nodes. And the opportunity cost of them behaving poorly is actually quite low. So proof of stake introduces a lot of things that are undesirable. So for example, you in practice need a minimum account balance in order for the network to believe that you're robust enough to make good decisions. So people have done different models, academics have done different models on what that balance looks like. And in today's world, it's something like a quarter million dollars. So if you don't have a quarter million dollars of a currency, we don't think or the network can't believe that you're a reliable enough node in order to call on you and ask you to make important decisions. Furthermore, there's other things. If only a few percentage of all of the money in the network is currently being staked, then we're leaving ourselves vulnerable to an attack where some very, very wealthy user could come online and completely dominate the vote. So in practice, networks have a minimum threshold of the total amount of currency that needs to be staked. And again, this is theorized to be somewhere around 15 to 25% of the total network currency. So we're also giving votes proportional to how wealthy people are. And that's, in principle, a fairly undesirable outcome. And so we're giving up a lot here of the spirit of decentralized, flat, everybody can participate, everybody can vote accordingly, um, in, the, in the name of doing it without doing useless computations, and now without like energy and efficiency. So proof of stake is a very, very good idea. And if we can mitigate a lot of these problems, then it's a fantastic consensus mechanism. But right now, there's a lot of very serious technical hurdles that cause us to make very undesirable trade-offs when we look at it. So uh, one that goes uh, into not only this topic of security, but also on sort of the idea of policy and, and uh, society. Uh, one of the, the great properties of public blockchains, especially you know, cryptocurrencies with a very robust proof-of-work security model is true censorship resistance. Uh, the fact that if I send a transaction to anyone anywhere in the world, that transaction will go through if it's valid and there's nothing anybody can do to stop it. Uh, but, you know, that's pretty, pretty cool in a lot of use cases, but you could foresee you know, some societal political issues with that as well. So do you, uh, any of you on the panel foresee uh, any threats to blockchain projects and decentralized currencies from uh, government powers that be or other public pressure? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, government will start to look at what's happening and add policy. The only way to rail in the wild, wild west of blockchain and distributed ledger is policy. But we don't need policy that becomes a complete block to us growing in the space, which is what I think will happen initially because there are people with money that do control what's happening and the government in different countries, not just America, will step in and say, let's throw policy over everything and then we'll walk our way back from that policy. And I do think that is needed, especially if proof of stake will work. You'll need very clear policies in place. That's just not law, but protocols to help people to stay in line. Uh, yeah, so policy can come through at a, at a lot of different levels here. Um, so we can have policy about participation in these networks. We could have policy about investment in these networks. So one of the things that we're seeing a lot of interest in right now, particularly from the United States um, and other governments, is policy surrounding uh, the investment in cryptocurrencies and crypto assets, as well as raising capital. So sort of back in the late 2017, early 2018 era, um, it was very common for new startups to raise capital by issuing digital tokens as cryptocurrencies. And this circumvents a lot of conventional laws about how you're supposed to fundraise money, how you're supposed to vet projects, what kind of assurance the investors are getting. 
And this raised a lot of the questions about whether or not some of these assets should be regulated um, in conventional ways like sharing, uh, selling shares of a company. So I think one of the aspects where policy can interject is people's ability to get financial exposure to cryptocurrencies. Um, kind of on the side is whether or not people should be participating at all. So for example, China has the, I guess, the privilege of hosting a lot of the mining power for Bitcoin right now and a lot of other cryptocurrencies. And this is a combination of access to cheap electricity um, and cheap real estate. But basically, they have the interesting uh, position of being able to write regulation about whether or not participating in the consensus protocol for ledgers that may or may not have different uh, impacts on the world is okay. So for example, it's in discussion that maybe China thinks that supporting Bitcoin is, a, is against their national policies. And if that's the case, then there's dramatic impacts to happen. And particularly, as this technology is fledgling, it's not yet robust enough to sort of withstand a major country um, banning or allowing some of these things. So I think everybody is a little bit concerned or, or a little bit sensitive to what the policies of different countries are um, as this technology develops. Yeah, I, I would honestly say that at least as of today in the U.S., I am, I think we're striking a semi-healthy balance. I think it could definitely be worse and there's always room for improvement, but I think it, in the grand scheme of things, regulators have certain priorities and some of them make a lot of sense, like anti-money laundering uh, and know your customer. And you could have different opinions about whether or not anyone should just be able to buy into these, especially if you're more uh, of a certain political mind where you just think, you know, government shouldn't be telling you what to do in the first place. But one of my major areas of personal interest is international drug markets uh, and international illegal markets in general, which cumulatively are about in the ballpark of $2 trillion amongst all illegal activities. And right, we're talking you know, 12th, 13th largest country in the world just from illegal activity. So I think that initially I was just, well, why are you putting limitations on things? But then once you start really zooming out and understanding the unintended usages of some of the things that we're talking about, at least for me, I, I had to reframe the way I was thinking about it a little bit, where initially I was much more bullish on, like, get the heck out of here, government, you don't know what you're talking about. Now it's like, oh no, I don't agree with your entire policy on the war of drugs over the last 50 years, but you're not that bad at stopping money laundering, and that is a massive movement for terrorism and people who murder a lot of people. So on that side of things, uh, and I'm forgetting the name of the organization, but there's pretty much like this international convening of, of major finance organizations, uh, uh, governmental, not private, uh, internationally. And there's a, a one year heading, a government steps in for a leader of this organization annually. The US just wrapped up that recently. And while we were in that position, we effectively nudged the whole world to say, you're kind of gonna get on our page with AML, KYC, with anti-money laundering or your customer, because the next president of this or, uh, uh, overseeing this will be China, which will have very different views on cryptocurrencies and, and what to sort of export internationally as the subtle underlying uh, governmental regime around these things. And then, yeah, you know. <laughs> so a, a lot of our first batch of questions here really focused on consensus and network security. Um, and that was intentional because I think that's a critical thing to understand when understanding blockchain um, inside or outside of the scope of cryptocurrencies. But let's pivot to another very important and sometimes controversial topic, which is that of privacy. Um, we know that most major public cryptocurrency chains like Bitcoin are pseudonymous, uh, but not anonymous. All of, all of your transactions can be tracked, essentially, and that's the nature of having a public ledger, public spreadsheet of who's uh, talking to who. So what are some ways that you think um, for both public and private chains that blockchain applications can protect privacy? I, I think the key point is the public-private keys. Um, having a public-private key can help you help protect private da data. And when you tokenize what you're doing, you only reveal the information that is absolutely needed. We have a, I'm part of a company that has a patent pending uh, cold wallet for a digital currency. And it's protected because you need both the public and the private key uh, to reveal what's actually 
in the wallet. And someone just cannot hack into your cold wallet, at least ours, um, without having both the public and private key. Your information is completely protected. Um, yeah, so I, I'd like to touch on sort of, if you look at, like uh, was mentioned, if you look at the sort of conventional first attempts at cryptocurrencies, like Bitcoin, um, what you see or what is publicly available is a history of transactions that are denoted by people's public keys. And so you can track flows of money, you can say who's who, which 10 keys belong to the same person, and you get a, a, a very rich set of information about what people are doing based on this. Um, it's actually phenomenal. So there are a number of initiatives to replace a lot of the conventional cryptocurrency mechanisms with this thing that's called a zero knowledge proof. And a zero knowledge proof is essentially a way of convincing people that I know of certain information, but I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but it's the right thing and I definitely know it. And so this idea of using zero knowledge proofs to or replace a lot of the traditional cryptocurrency mechanisms has been applied in currencies like Monero and Zerocash. And so the idea is here is that we can almost do everything that we want um, without leaking much information at all about what's going on. Now, I should mention that there is a clear void in what we're able to do in this zero knowledge setting. And currently that's something that's called smart contracts. So cryptocurrencies support the ability for people to do very rich um, interactions. So instead of just sending and receiving money, we can establish a relationship using code that governs how money flows between us or multiple parties. That mechanism right now, while theoretically can be hidden, practically speaking cannot be. Um, so that's kind of the cusp of where we're academically at and the ability to protect privacy. And I think it's, I mean, I'm very excited to see some of, some of the changes come, uh, but I think one, taking this question slightly from a different perspective uh, and talking more about the human side of transparency, because I think that, uh, you know, initially people thought Bitcoin was fully anonymous. They bought drugs, they did this, they did that. Don't buy drugs with Bitcoin, it is a bad idea. If the government wants to find out who you are and you take that Bitcoin and you turn it into US dollars at some point, they're gonna find you, don't do it. So to Kyle's point, I think there's been so much work done on the traceability of certain things. Yes, there's mixers. Yes, there's different currencies which can sort of obfuscate things in a certain way. Uh, and I know at, at the university, we have someone from a, a, an international government that is actively doing research out of our office, pretty much trying to better understand what do they do about Monero and Zcash and the, the people that are you know administering entire drug markets, especially through dark web purchases with, with Zcash and Monero. They literally have no clue what to do and no clue how, how to actually do it through the currency. They're doing you know investigation all around it, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting concept. So th that's still a challenge where we don't know. Uh, there are certain things which are going to provide a tremendous amount of privacy. Again, jumping back to the, the drug markets, the, all of the illegal things, that kind of makes me scared because if all of a sudden we give every cartel, you know, the CEO of every cartel, you know, call them whatever you want, but the people who run massive organizations that love killing people and, and trafficking people and doing all these things, if you just pretty much hand them a handbook of like, here's how you're never gonna get caught again, that, that's a little worrying to me, and I know that's not what's... Yeah, so I'd like, to, I'd like to cast a little light on the doom and gloom. Um, this gets back to the sort of debate that we've had nationally about encryption. So there's been in the news, should Apple unlock people's iPhones? Is strong encryption good? There's two sides to this, right? There's people's privacy, but then there's the case where selectively revealing people's privacy may have a greater benefit or externality to society. Um, so the same mechanisms by which people are able to get away with crimes and potentially obfuscate illegal activities can also be the same technologies that can uh, hide a healthcare record or, or something that we deem important and necessary in society. So we have mechanisms to do both. In practice, we see more illicit activities using it, but that doesn't mean that we can't utilize these same technologies to construct beneficial technologies as well. And that's where I think the, I, I, and I, the last thing I wanted to say is like we shouldn't have this. In my opinion, that's where it's so important to have good policy around it, right? AML, KYC on every exchange in the world, 
great, you just got rid of the illegal part and you let people preserve their privacy, right? So there absolutely are balances. We're at a very interesting time where the technology, the policy, the governance, everything is still up for grabs and nothing is set in stone in terms of where we're at and where we're headed. So now it's a super exciting time to get involved because you can be part of this change and part of making the future that we all hopefully want to see. Yeah, it is, it is quite an exciting and interesting topic, especially when it comes to privacy and, and perhaps uh, in the crypto community, what is even defined as illicit? Uh, you know, when you talk about like the Silk Road and the Free Ross movement, and um, you know, even using these as a powerful tool for subversion when it might be uh, warranted, depending on your, your political persuasion. You know, um, journalist dissidents and that sort of thing being able to use these technologies for for good, uh, even in a way that might be seen as not legal or under the table. So uh, going from there. Uh, you mentioned the topic of tokenization. So this is an interesting topic I wanted to bring up. Um, so tokenization is the idea that in the future, uh, we might transfer assets like our home deeds or our car titles with, uh, with one another using a token on a blockchain to represent that asset, rather than going to the DMV and having a government organization uh, transfer the title or the deed for us. I recently prototyped this by putting my lawn tractor on the blockchain and almost lighting my shed on fire in the process. <laughs> but uh, it's an interesting topic and I would love to hear your thoughts, panelists, on tokenization and do you think that we will see a future where we trade uh, assets in this way? So, so I think tokenization is so interesting um, and I do think that there is a future for it. So. Tokenization allows users to control access to essentially a digital representation of their asset. Um, but I've seen it come out in a number of ways that are a little bit careless to the underlying economics of the situation. Um, so let me explain what I mean by that. There's a very real sense in which the value of the asset that you're tokenizing and the way that you're trading it is directly related to the underlying consensus mechanisms and the incentives of the blockchain itself. So what I mean by that is, we have a blockchain that is secured by a game where people spend money to vote. Now, if you're trading assets whose prices are astronomically higher than the underlying blockchain, then we run into some serious problems. So we had a game, or there was a game on Ethereum called FOMO 3D. And this game was very peculiar because there was essentially a pot of money and a timer that counted down. And you would buy a ticket, and that ticket would put your name into the game. And whoever was the last person to hold a ticket when the timer hit zero won the entire pot. And this pot was big. It was like five or six or seven million dollars. So you wonder, how does this game ever end? Wouldn't people just keep buying tickets and extending the timer indefinitely? And what some clever person understood is that the amount of money that was the reward for this game was so large that it made sense to physically attack the network in order to win it. So what they did is they went out and they spent about $20,000 and they paid off the network and said, don't let anybody else submit a transaction for the next five minutes, only me. And that $20,000 was enough money to bribe the network into doing this. And they were able to place a transaction, buy the last t ticket, and let the timer hit zero because nobody else was allowed to buy a ticket during this time. And so this is an example where the amount of money offered by this game exceeded the security of the network and it made sense to attack it. So now, suppose that you're trying to tokenize a billion dollar hotel and you want to sell that on the blockchain, you want to move <laughs> that. That asset is going to disrupt the underlying consensus of the, of the cryptocurrency if it is so much larger than everything else around it. So tokenization, I think, is a very important concept, but the maturity or the sense in which cryptocurrency is mature enough to handle tokenization is when cryptocurrencies are worth enough money that each individual token is insignificant to the bigger picture. Thankfully, my 1997 lawn <laughs> tractor is not worth more than the market capitalization of uh, Bitcoin Cash, so I didn't crash anything with the prototype, but uh, we'll see what happens when people start putting houses on the blockchain, yeah. I suppose. There are definitely co uh, companies already tokenizing assets. It's something uh, a few real estate companies are doing. They're also securitizing that tokenized asset where you can now invest into it. 
and they've taken digitized asset and say, okay, you can purchase a portion of it. Um, I do agree that there are a lot of irresponsible projects out there in trying to tokenize assets, but I do see that as the future. I see even resumes, people will be tokenized in terms of their value. Tokenization of value and tokenization of assets and selling that off. I, I, I know we don't know when it will happen, but it is in our future. Yeah, and one thing that I guess we didn't speak about, I think we talked about supply chain at a certain point, I don't know, I'm very tired. But um, in general, one of the issues with all of this is the conversion of the physical to the digital. Uh, and the easier, the you know, having a vote being, having a shareholder vote where everything is done digitally in the first place, except, you know, the piece of mail that you get, what you want to vote and send back, if that's digitized, Versus, you know, the, the chocolate example that I mentioned earlier, I think that's an issue so that that extends into the whole concept of tokenization. Uh, and I know that there are absolutely certain, corp certain corporate functions where a certain process is already being digitally mapped, say an oil gas flow through a pipeline. You know, those companies have already spent billions upon billions of dollars trying to understand how much they lose between mile marker one and mile marker two. But is that enough? And especially going back to the, the point of, you know, people, again, <laughs> ingenuity of people is limitless, right? Someone can always find a way to tweak and play and push it in the wrong way. So if we start with, if it's something innocuous and something not of high value, okay, it broke, big deal. If it's, you know, a 20 year old lawnmower. If it's this building or a billion dollars or your house, right? And you're the first experiment and it goes wrong and you just lost that, you wouldn't want to be that person. I know I wouldn't want to be that person. So that's where I think that there also needs to be a bit of a balance between always wanting to barrel forward with the actual underlying technology, which is a healthy desire, but that needs to be checked with, if this goes horribly wrong, who's gonna get hurt in the process? And we gotta make sure that we're, we're putting a net around that somehow. Because it is, I just think it's irresponsible to always, you know, move fast and break things. And like, thanks, Mark. You know, that's gone wonderfully for, for the world so far with Facebook and democracy. So I, I just do, I think people need to be a little cautious about thinking through the potential unintended consequences of what you're tokenizing, digitizing. Yeah, so I want to say that, especially if you're tokenizing things that are worth money, we have ways of dealing with this, right? We have economic markets, and the markets will decide what they like. So tokenizing an asset is going to carry with it an underlying risk. So as long as that risk is priced in and people are willing to pay it, then it makes sense to tokenize some of these things. Now, one of the uh, arguments that I've heard for the tokenization of assets is that the conventional uh, infrastructure for dealing with things like housing deeds and permits and things like that is horribly, horribly inefficient. Right. You have centralized governments that aren't properly incentivized to really streamline their processes and so it feels like blockchains might be the way to circumvent some of that inefficiency. However, the underlying risk is going to cause the tokenized version of whatever asset to carry with it a premium. So as long as those premiums are greater than the inefficiencies of government, this really won't make a lot of economic sense. So the point at which we know we're doing it right is when the market decides that those premiums are in fact less than whatever overhead you currently pay for an existing process. So that's really the gap that we're trying to drive things towards. And, and just one more quick thing there. I would also add, it depends where in the world you're looking in the maturity of certain things there. Like I know my roommate is from a village in India where they don't keep land records, they don't keep birth records. Like it, it's kind of shocking the little amount of records that they keep. So there, if you want to start playing with it, you know, of course the economics needs to be factored in, but there are places in the world where they already are in much more need of an initial solution. And so if you're offering the ability to leapfrog, you know, having to develop things in the first place, that's usually a, a great reason to start playing around with it, especially if it's not like, get the whole country out of tomorrow, you know, if, if it's measured and rolled out correctly. Right, so yeah, if you, have, if you have places like that where the local government, are, or people are pricing in a certain risk to the local government, and then the, the risk of you know, tokenizing it on a blockchain is in fact less than that, then I expect those to be sort of the first adopters. And if you're sort of in a jurisdiction where the infrastructure is not that bad and you know, the deeding process can be tedious but it's not that awful and there's a low risk priced in, um, those would sort of be your last adopters or your, your poorest candidates for tokenization. It's definitely a matter of uh, usability as well. You know, I, the, the rough prototype that I'm thinking of, right, is you know you tr you get your uh, your new car, tr 
transferred to you on the blockchain. So you have a crypto wallet with a public key and a private key that signs for that. Uh, and you get in the car and there's a little uh, digital signature challenge response and the car starts for you. Well, if you do what we've all done and admit it and you drop your phone in the toilet or run it over or have some problem and you're one of the folks that forgot to back up your wallet seed phrase, uh, now you can't go anywhere. So there's, there's a lot of kinks to work out uh, with this concept of tokenization. So we are at about 45 minutes into the panel. I'd like to ask one more question of you all uh, in the interest of time and then leave lots of time for question and answer session for our audience. So we spent the evening talking about uh, the concept of going beyond cryptocurrencies for blockchain, right? People want to talk about business and that sort of thing. Uh, but let's be honest, I mean, the first project that came out and made the world excited about this technology is the cryptocurrencies. So for each one of you, I would like you to answer what is your favorite major cryptocurrency project and why? I can answer. I, I don't have one. Um, there are so many that are doing great things. Uh, part of my bias is some of the people I know personally, and I think they're great people, and I love what they're trying to do. Um, but time is, is what's unpredictable. You know, just like you said, when myself and a group of people started in blockchain, we thought in three years we'll be in Puerto Rico popping bottles and celebrating, you know, the launch of what we're doing. But um, now more than three years later, I sit and, and do presentations and when I'm finished, someone says, uh, Janae, what's blockchain? And I just spoke for an hour. Um, so the timing of, of what will happen is interesting. I don't have a favorite project, but I, I do love a lot of what's happening in certain spaces. So my, uh, my favorite project in the space right now is a project called MakerDAO. And what MakerDAO does is they try and create stability out of chaos with respect to the volatility of the price of cryptocurrencies. Um, cryptocurrencies are interesting, and a lot of sort of what's attracted people to them is the idea of being able to get rich because the price goes up wildly sometimes. But this is in direct opposition usually to their utility. Um, the people who want to engage with cryptocurrency services for the interest of doing something other than investment are really sort of set back by the fact that they're taking on all this extra risk of price volatility. So MakerDAO attempts to establish stability in the form of a stable coin on top of a decentralized ledger whose price is very volatile. So I think that this is going to be, if it is successful in the long term, a huge catalyst to the underlying usability and utility of what blockchain can offer. God, lead me to the punch. Uh, I'll, I'll generalize that to, I think DAO projects in general are some are, are the area where there's a lot of interesting work happening. Uh, in addition to MakerDAO, I think there's like DAO stack and two or three other ones that I'm forgetting. Thank you. A decentralized autonomous organization or a DAO is the idea of using smart contracts uh, and various ways to automate as many operations uh, within an organization as possible. So actually a DAO was one of the first things that I got excited about when getting into this world. Uh, the first project that I worked on we called EduDAO, which was the uh, idea of creating an educational and nonprofit focused DAO where you imagine having a crowdfunding platform uh, and if, if anyone has actually been in the space since 2016, you're like, are you talking about the DAO? No, but it was inspired around that and solving for the massive issues they had. But for us, our goal was not to actually pay people back investment returns. Our goal was to automate the process of giving. And so the reason we wanted a DAO type structure for this, uh, because just to automate the process of giving, you don't need a DAO, you don't need blockchain, you don't need these other things. The part for us that made it really excited was that, well, we can build this structure across New York City where there are many different groups that do not trust each other, that want each other's money, that fundamentally will question how everything's getting spent. And especially if you add the right community partners as sort of the oversight groups on double checking that every proposal that gets put up is what it's supposed to be and filled with what it should, you know, then we can work as a community to say, hey, I see you got a proposal to buy, you know, laptops for that local school. I can actually get a 10% better deal and we can start working as a community to refine how we can invest in and where we want to invest in our, our own community. We stopped because of exactly what Kyle was talking about with the benefits of MakerDAO. It was just too volatile and crazy. 
And for nonprofits, which I'm sorry, you said my 10,000, which you just raised for me, can become nine tomorrow for some reason. Right. No, thank you. So they were they were pretty strong between the tax implications and that that it was just too early days. We're actually trying to go back to the drawing board this year with MakerDAO. Uh, we're talking to MakerDAO and some of the others to see kind of what what will make the most sense for us to really get to launch this platform this time. I myself am a big fan of just the general concept of peer-to-peer -peer cash. So, you know, I think that cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin offer a more secure way for us to transact with each other. And it's also much more focused on individual empowerments and, and sovereignty and liberties. Uh, the ability to control your own money in a way that you don't with a bank and a credit card. So I'm a big fan of projects like Litecoin, um, Bitcoin Cash, which is a fork of Bitcoin that emerged uh, due to some, some political differences in the communities about what these uh, chains would be used for, um, and really anything else out there that's promoting that you know, sort of day-to-day, peer-to-peer use case. Um, so I want to really thank our panelists for all of their insight tonight. It was really fun to have this discussion with you all. And uh, I think at this point, we will open it up to questions. So I think it would be best if uh, you panelists, uh, you can take and, and pick them as you like. Okay. I think I saw your hand go up first. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm involved with a great local meetup called Blockchain in the Berg. Uh, this was founded by Rebecca White and Laura Taylor, who are two fantastic, passionate ladies uh, that love to spread this technology. I'm kind of their unofficial tech advisor, but I can't claim founder. Um, so you can definitely you know, come ask me about it. Tomorrow, we are having our usual monthly Thursday night meetup, and it will be at Nova Place in Allegheny Center on the north side. Um, we are having somebody that is an expert and uh, business person working in mining and energy consumption. Uh, so it's going to be an interesting topic and we often go out uh, to Federal Galley afterwards as well. So no matter your level of technical expertise or what particular topics you're interested in, we're not maximalists for any one thing, so please join us.